In 1879, there was a 16-year-old boy who left his father's farm and set off for Detroit. This was when trains and horse carriages were the main ways people traveled. But he was thinking about something different. That young boy was the visionary behind the modern car. It's essentially to revolutionize how we think about technology. Isn't that incredible? His name was Henry Ford, and he became one of the richest men in American history. Henry Ford's story is like something out of a thrilling book, filled with bravery, creativity, and success. So, are you ready to learn more about this? Well, let's get into the video. Henry Ford was born on July 30th, 1863, on a farm in Dearborn, Michigan. He was the oldest of eight kids. Even though people thought he'd be a farmer like his dad, Henry wasn't into farming. He didn't like school much either, and stopped going after eighth grade. He once said, I never had any particular love for the farm. It was the mother on the farm I loved. It's like he found a special connection with nature, but not with farming itself. What got Henry excited was the machines. When he was just 12, he took apart a pocket watch his dad gave him, fixed it up, he even started fixing watches for friends and neighbors. Word got around, and soon, he had a little reputation as the local watch repairman. When Henry was 13, he saw his first steam engine on a school trip to Detroit. This sparked his love for machines. Over the next few years, Henry made it his mission to learn everything about mechanics. By the time he was 15, he had built his very own steam engine, but life took a heartbreaking turn when he lost his beloved mother, Mary Ford, to a sudden illness. Heartbroken and tired of farm life, Henry left home at 16, against his dad's wishes. In Detroit, he worked at Michigan Car Company Works, eager to learn. Sadly, he got fired after just six days. But Henry bounced back, landing a job at James Flower and Brothers Machine Shop, where he started as an apprentice. Money was tight, so he worked nights as a jeweler, drawing on his love for watches from childhood. In 1882, at 19, Henry returned to Michigan but didn't go back to farming. Instead, he played with machines on the farm. His dad had a portable steam engine, which Henry loved tinkering with. He got so good that neighbors hired him to fix their engines. In 1885, Henry got engaged to Clara, and Henry's dad gave them land as a wedding gift. But Henry didn't want to farm. He saw the potential for something new. In 1891, Henry and Clara moved to Detroit. They settled in, and Henry found a British magazine that introduced him to the gas engine, sparking a new passion. Henry noticed a gas engine designed by Nicholas Otto, a German engineer. It was different from steam engines and caught Henry's attention. Though popular in Europe, few in America knew about it. Henry found one in Detroit, and it fascinated him. But he didn't understand how it worked, especially with its reliance on an electric spark. Henry landed a job as a night engineer at the Edison Illuminating Company, earning $40 a month. He worked on fixing the steam engine and powering the city's electricity. In 1893, he got promoted to chief engineer with a hefty $100 weekly paycheck. That same year, he achieved a milestone by creating his working gas engine, a crucial step toward his dream of building a horseless carriage. Then, on June 4, 1896, at the stroke of 1.30 a.m., Henry achieved another milestone. He completed his experimental car, powered by a gas engine. He called it the quadricycle, a basic contraption made of two bicycles side by side, chugging along with a gasoline engine. Sure, it had its quirks, no reverse gear, no cooling system, and prone to overheating, but Henry wasn't discouraged. He kept tweaking and adjusting. And you know what? He eventually sold that car for $200, using the money for his next big project. With the backing of Detroit's mayor, Henry began crafting his second experimental car. It was a sturdy beast, finished by July 1899, larger and tougher than his first. One fine morning, he took a wealthy lumber merchant, William Murphy, for a spin. Impressed, Murphy jumped aboard Henry's business wagon. On August 5, 1899, the Detroit Automobile Company roared to life. Yet, despite their early promise, the company stalled within a year. Henry's vision clashed with stakeholders demanding passenger cars, parts delays snarled production. Even Henry's optimistic spirit couldn't keep the wheels turning, but failure sprang from opportunity. Henry pivoted to racing cars, sensing their growing popularity. His designs left competitors eating dust, attracting the attention of investors wary after the Detroit debacle. Thus, the Ford Motor Company roared into existence with Henry at the helm. 
But tensions brewed as Henry continued his love affair with racing. Investors wanted mass market cars, not speed demons. When they brought in Henry Leland to steer the ship, Henry Ford hit the brakes and exited stage left. Undeterred, he teamed up with Tom Cooper, churning out record-breaking racers like the Ford 999. Speeding past competitors, Henry solidified his reputation as America's racing car guru. By 1904, Henry's cars were setting records at breakneck speeds. With each victory, his path to a third company became clearer. Henry Ford's journey was a testament to resilience, innovation, and the relentless pursuit of speed. With the help of 11 investors, including a Chile dealer named Alexander Young Malcolmson from Detroit, Henry Ford started his third company. At first, it was called Ford and Malcolmson Limited, but later on it became the Ford Motor Company in 1902. After failing twice before, Henry was determined not to fail again. Well, as today as they were a few years ago, I think so. Yes, indeed. If a young man makes up his mind to work, there's no limit to what he can do. If he makes up his mind to go at it without the idea of work, uh, he hasn't much chance. He must study and work, and he must go back in any art as far as he can to dig up the very beginning. And he must, and the more he goes back, the further he will be able to see ahead. He wanted to make cars that regular people could afford. Back then, only rich people could buy cars because they were too expensive. Most cars were made for racing, and only skilled engineers could make them. Henry told his friends and investors that he wanted to make a car for the great multitude, something simple yet made of the best stuff and cheap enough for anyone with a good job to buy. Henry was good at finding smart people to work with. He hired a bunch of young, bright minds who believed in his idea. After trying out many designs, they finally got it right with the Model A, and then later with the Model N. But what changed things the most wasn't just how the cars looked, but how they were made. Henry learned from his mistakes and figured out that if he got all the parts for his cars from one place, it would be easier and faster to build them. Then, he got an idea from watching how animals were processed at a slaughterhouse in Chicago. He thought, if we can do that with cars, we can make them much quicker. So. Henry set up his factory in 1905 and started using what he called an assembly line. Instead of building cars one at a time, they built them step by step as they moved down a line. This made things much faster. It was like a big puzzle with each worker doing their small part. In 1908, they came up with the Model T, which became really famous. It was strong and simple, and lots of people wanted one. The Model T greatly expanded Americans' mobility knitting America very close together at the same time that it opened American sense of what was possible. So he liberated, at the individual level, the human spirit. Henry Ford was a revolutionary. Even though it was expensive at first, the price eventually went down and it became the most popular car in America. To make even more cars, Henry needed a bigger factory. So he built one in Highland Park, Michigan. This new factory had a better assembly line, and they could make cars even faster. They went from taking 12 hours to make one car to only 90 minutes. By 1910, Ford was making more cars than anyone else. They sold almost a million Model Ts between 1910 and 1916. And because they were making so many, they could sell them for cheaper. In fact, by 1916, a Model T that used to cost $850 was now less than $400. But making so many cars meant hiring lots of workers. Henry wanted to keep his workers happy, so he paid them more money, $5 a day, which was a lot back then. Other companies thought he was crazy, but it worked. People from all over came to work for Ford, and soon, other companies had to pay their workers more too. Henry's company grew so much that in 1919, he bought out all the other investors. Now he was the boss of the biggest car company in the world, he even made his son, Edsel, the president of the company. But everyone knew that Henry was still in charge. Even though he was really rich and powerful, Henry knew that being the boss came with challenges. But he had changed the car business forever and set new rules for how to treat workers fairly. Henry Ford's story is one of hard work, big ideas, and changing the world for the better. Henry Ford, sticking to his guns, believed that everyone still wanted his Model T car, even as other companies were making fancier models like the Chevrolet. He didn't listen to his executives or even his son Edsel when they said it was time for something new, 
but by the late 1920s, it was hard to ignore the fact that fewer and fewer people were buying Model Ts. So Henry finally decided to stop making them and start working on a brand new car. A car that takes you anywhere you want to go. The Model T. Strong, sturdy, with a will of its own. called the Model A, hit the streets in 1927. But instead of making it at the old Highland Park factory, they built a bigger one by the Rogue River in Michigan. Henry wanted this new factory to do everything, from making parts from scratch to putting the cars together. It became the biggest factory in the world, making steel, glass, tires, and everything else needed for the cars. However, Henry's way of making decisions on his own wasn't working so well anymore. By 1936, Ford Motor Company was no longer on top. They fell behind General Motors and Chrysler. Even though Henry came up with a cool new engine called the V8, it didn't help much. As if things weren't tough enough, the Great Depression hit. Ford had to lay off workers and cut prices to stay afloat. In 1943, Henry's son died, but Henry kept running the company for a couple more years before passing the torch to his grandson, Henry II. Henry retired to his estate, but sadly passed away in 1947. He believed that tough times help us grow, and Ford Motor Company, worth about $70 billion today, is still a big name in the car world. He changed all of 20th century America. We're living in Henry Ford's world right now. <laughs> 